So I completely fixed my lactose intolerance, based on this cool paper from the 90s. But what I learned from this paper was a dark truth of absolutes. This isn't a method a real medical doctor would tell you. It basically involves cramming lactose for two weeks and suffering the protests of every part of your digestion. This is not a recommendation, this is a documentation of the power of science and the lengths I went to to be able to eat mozzarella sticks again. All was well between me and my love of milk until COVID. At least that's what I told myself, though in retrospect, the signs of my decreasing lactase production were present. I was just ignoring them. Lockdown was what sent my lactose intolerance spiraling. My schedule was jumbled, I was too depressed to make myself nice morning drinks, so I stopped drinking milk tea for a few months. When I finally had milk again, it was bad. Like, really bad. Bad enough, I decided to try out lactose-free milk, and that's where this adventure begins. So I tried lactose-free milk, but it didn't really work for me. Like, it kind of did, but not super well. I would say my symptoms went down by maybe, like, a third, but I really wanted no symptoms. So I looked into how lactose-free milk is made. So to zoom out, lactose is a complex sugar in milk that needs a special enzyme, lactase, to break it down during digestion. To make lactose-free milk, they extract lactase enzymes from fungi and then add them straight to the milk to break down the lactose before you even drink it. Actually, cheese and yogurt are generally not as bad for people with lactose intolerance because the microorganisms that ferment them also eat and break down the lactose. I wasn't sure why lactose-free milk didn't work super well for me. I wondered whether maybe mixing lactase with milk didn't yield a complete reaction for whatever reason. I decided to read more about how exactly the process worked. I went on Google Scholar and searched lactose breakdown, or something like that, and found this great paper from the 90s. Colonic adaptation to daily lactose feeding in lactose maldigesters reduces lactose intolerance. Basically, if you're a lactose maldigester, meaning you're lactose intolerant, and you consume lactose daily, your colon will adapt. But what inspired this research? You see, the United States had an excess of powdered milk in the 80s and decided to donate it to countries experiencing famine. Countries where no one could digest lactose. The United States routinely has offered non-fat dry milk, of which this nation has millions of tons in surplus, as a food commodity to impoverished regions of the globe. In some cases, the donation has caused more problems than were solved. Powdered milk, frequently, is distributed to areas where milk is not part of the typical diet, which is particularly true in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Despite fairly severe reactions from the lactose maldigesters subsisting on a diet of straight powdered milk, after a few weeks, their symptoms subsided and they were able to consume the milk. But why? Most people with lactose intolerance are actually the evolutionary default. For them, the mammalian lactase gene, the DNA instructions to make the lactase enzyme, are only active as a baby. This makes sense because in nature, only babies nurse. This lactase gene stops being expressed after they would have been weaned, meaning no more lactase enzyme, meaning no more chocolate banana split sundaes. But some populations have developed lactase persistence, where their bodies do continue to create the lactose enzyme. The sub-Saharan population, given the powdered milk, did not have this lactose persistence mutation. They didn't have any lactase. So the question is, how did their bodies adapt to the lactose? Did their mammalian lactase genes start expressing when they were exposed to high levels of lactose? No. What really changed was their gut biome. You see, we digest the food we eat, but so do a myriad of various bacteria living in our guts. When someone with lactose intolerance eats a large amount of lactose over the course of a few weeks, the population of gut bacteria that can digest the lactose explodes. And then they're blessed with mutualistic symbiosis, a colony of hungry microbes digesting the lactose for them. Now Hendry, you might say, don't the symptoms of regular old lactose intolerance also come from lactose passing intact to the colon and being consumed by bacteria that also produce massive amounts of hydrogen causing gas and bloating? What would cause there to be less gas in this case? Good question. The paper proposes that the kinds of bacteria that flourish on the very high lactose diet are bifidobacteria that are non-hydrogen producing. So no more bloat, gas, or pain. Eventually. So of course, I read this paper and I had to try it myself. My instinct said, it's the lockdown, go for it. So I went to my local grocery store and bought several boxes of powdered milk so I could ensure maximum lactose concentration.
I poured it into my glass jar. And then I added less water than it called for because I wanted sort of this like thick slurry. And then I chugged it nonstop for two weeks. Wow, the smell is really bringing me back. First came the pain, intense stomach cramps, and very loud stomach grumbles, or borborygmus, heralding the beginnings of the battle. Then came the smell. If you have roommates, they will despise you. Then came the extended bathroom time. Turns out, the excess lactose in your colon also messes with your osmotic pressure. There will be a lot of liquid. My entire digestive system was groaning in protestation. But this was only day one. I believe in science. I couldn't give up yet. The second day was a bit better, only in that our sense of smell relies somewhat on novelty. So if you smell the same farts for long enough, you basically stop smelling them. Or at least that's what I told my roommates. Day three. At this point, I was starting to get dehydrated, despite all the liquid I was drinking. I was losing too many electrolytes. My solution, of course, was to add some salt to my milk slurry. This was fine. I mean, I wasn't doing this for the taste of powdered milk. I was doing it for the ice cream sundaes of my future. Day four was bad. Day five was bad. Even I was starting to question whether a diet of pure powdered milk was really the best interpretation of this study. And perhaps in my over-eagerness, I was putting myself through more than was reasonably necessary. Day seven was an improvement, mostly because I let myself eat other food, as well as the powdered milk. After that, though, I started to experience a logarithmic decay of symptoms. By the end of the two weeks, I was nearly asymptomatic. And by that, I mean back to my regular old irritable bowel syndrome symptoms. So now I had to test my newfound lactose superpowers. I got all of my favorite foods that caused me problems. Ice cream, soft cheese, milk tea, and nothing. No problems at all. I was cured. Would I recommend this method? No. Also, for some reason, I'm still kind of sensitive to whey, but only when it's an ingredient in something else, like a protein bar. Maybe I need to do a whey diet next. Also, just because this worked for me, it probably wouldn't work for everyone. Everyone's gut biome is different. Also, while lactase intolerance does not cause damage to the gastrointestinal tract, it sure feels like it does. I'm not a doctor, and I'm pretty sure no sane doctor would recommend this to anyone. I just wanted to share my cautionary tale. She fixed her lactose intolerance. But at what cost? I just like reading cool papers and trying to solve my problems with science. Bonus fact. Cheddar cheese is only orange because it's dyed orange. Some kinds of cows have fat globules that are orange from carotene. So historically, if a cheese was orange, it was a sign of high fat content and quality. Then, less scrupulous folks realized you could just dye it orange with an auto. Bonus bonus fact. In the Middle Ages, milk was known as the virtuous white liquid because it was generally safer to drink than most of the water available at the time. Turns out, dumping sewage into the water supply wasn't great. Also, they thought milk was blood from the womb and treated it like blood in humor-related treatments. Bonus, bonus, bonus fact. I mentioned this in my moose video. There are a few small moose dairy farms in Russia and Sweden where you can get moose milk. Donkeys and horses have the lowest known percentage of milk fat at around 1%, compared to cows 3% and humans 4%. Seals and whales may have more than 50% milk fat. Because the milk is so fatty and less liquidy, multiple kinds of birds and feral cats are known to steal elephant seal milk directly from the seal. Bonus aside, ever since I was born, I really loved milk and other dairy products with a brief interruption in middle school. You see, I was sitting in the back of my library near the magazine shelves, reading a copy of Cosmo, clandestinely hidden in a copy of Fly Fisher Monthly. And I came across an article with something like, five reasons your crush won't kiss you. And number five was, you recently ate something stinky or drank milk and your crush can smell it. I was horrified. I drink milk all the time. That could clearly be the only reason why my crush didn't want to smooch me. 
definitely the only one. Nothing to do with me being incredibly strange. I abstained from milk for a few years, until I finally managed to get a new crush to smooch me, and realized that if your crush wants to smooch you, they don't actually really care what you drink. 